Hey, all right, man. Also, it's great to have you. Thank you for making the time. Uh, it's a lot of pressure to interview a professional podcaster. <laughs> uh, far from it, but uh, happy to be on. No, uh, you know, I had the pleasure of going on your podcast, Cracks, and you know, I want to dive a little deeper into your background in a bit, but I guess we're all, while we're on the topic of your podcast, um, you know, for the audience that isn't from Mexico listening, how do you describe someone that's a crack, you know? Like, what, what makes someone a crack? Um, you know, what will, you know, give, give us a little bit more uh, about that, uh, given that that's some, you know, jerga, no sé mexicano or latinoamericano, but uh, uh, it's something that, you know, uh, the first time I heard it, I was like, I didn't, I didn't really know what it was. I kind of right. got the idea now, but, but just for the audience, uh, just share what that is. So, so that's, that's one of the things that, uh, contrary to the way I usually operate, uh, I just went with it because I think the only like real moment of genius marketing wise that I've had in my entire life is coming up with the name of the podcast cracks. And it, it is a word that doesn't translate to English at all. Right. Uh, I mean, usually whenever like my, my startup was called InstaFit and you always think is that maybe it's the malinchismo in, in the Mexican in, in me, uh, or it's just like, the dream of hitting the, the jackpot with the huge market, which is the US. And you always try to have like this English accent or English angle to anything that you brand or anything that you create. And the podcast just doesn't have it. Uh, a crack, it, crack is a word that is usually uh, used in, in Latin American slang, um, mostly referring to people that dominate their industries, especially sports. So a crack is a, is a very popular, popular word in, in soccer slang, right? Uh, Messi is a crack. Cristiano Ronaldo is a crack. Maradona was a crack. Pelé was a crack. Uh, and it's usually someone who really is at the top of their game. They can dribble, they can score, they're fast, and they have like this, like, uh, stardom to them. And that's what I think a crack is, uh, when you translate it to, any other vertical, uh, especially business, entertainment, sports, obviously. Uh, it's just someone who dominates, who is super capable, someone who uh, basically lives their lives in, in their own terms. Um, that's what I think a crack is. Uh, someone who just goes for it, uh, has big goals, chases after them, and usually achieves them. Amazing. I, I want to double click on that in a little bit and we'll, we'll dive deeper into towards the you know, second half of the episode. We'll talk a little bit more about you know, cracks and some things you've learned from that and you know, how that kind of evolved into a venture fund and all the interesting stuff that you have going on. But I think that for the benefit of our audience, it'd be great to get a little bit more on your background and you know, maybe you know, you, you, I'll give a little uh, and then you can expand on it. But you know, you, you, you studied uh, industrial engineering in the beginning of, you know, early 2000s. You worked in the financial sector. Um, and then in 2009, you co-founded a retail startup called Tuyo. What made you want to become a founder? And, you know, <laughs> how did you prepare going in from, you know, this different sector and changing your experience? Like, talk, talk us through how, how that all evolved. So, yeah, that wasn't in my plans at all. Uh, I don't come from a family of entrepreneurs. Uh, when I was younger in Mexico City, there were like businessmen and then employees. You didn't have an entrepreneur. You, you were either a business owner, a big one, or you worked for a big company. And that was the track that I chose for myself. Um, I always thought I was going to climb the corporate ladder. Uh, I worked in the financial industry in Mexico. Uh, I worked in the insurance industry. I lived in 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 London, uh, in Mexico City, I rose up the ranks and then I uh, went to Stanford. Uh, that's where I got my MBA. Um, you know, I was there from 06 to 08 with the sole purpose of get, landing a job in New York City, doing banking, any type of banking. Uh, you know, I was there during Facebook's early days, during Airbnb's early days, uh, even I think it was a little earlier uh, than Uber. But it never crossed my mind to really jump into tech. And I was at the epicenter, right? Like I have friends who started Facebook apps that got sold for hundreds of thousands of dollars while we were at school. And I, I just couldn't understand it. Like coding for me was a different world. And my sights were set on New York City. And that's what I uh, tailored my program towards, uh, you know, financial modeling, 
growth of companies and I, I got what I wanted. Uh, during the summer of 07, I spent the summer work for, working for Goldman Sachs and then I did a little internship in Brazil. Uh, and that was like kind of the time when, when the market had its first hic hiccup during the summer of 07. And I ended up working for UBS after I graduated from Stanford, moved to New York, had a fantastic year there, but it was 08 and shit hit the fan. Uh, not only did I not like the work that I was doing because, you know, I was, my hands were tied, uh, money was flying out of the door. Um, it was not an, a good place to be. Uh, but I also felt like my job involved talking to a lot of Latin American entrepreneurs whose money we were managing. Uh, and listening to their stories and feeling that my role was to be on the other side of the table was very frustrating. So that combined with me not really liking my boss. I remember this day uh, at a club, a nightclub in New York City, and uh, I was complaining about my job, my life. Uh, you know, I was making a decent amount of money, spending it all on rent and nightlife. And then one of my friends said, uh, you know, you complain so much about your boss uh, maybe you should try being your own boss. And that kind of planted a seed in my brain. I never thought of myself as an entrepreneur. I, I had some exposure to entrepreneurs at Stanford and uh, I ended up raising my hand, getting laid off, uh, getting some severance and moving back to Mexico. Um, you know, I came back with nothing. I, I had no car. I had no house. I had no job. I had only had my severance. I uh, basically came back worse than when I left um, my mom must have been a little worried because I had to move back with her after years of living abroad. Um, and then I just started, uh, I still tried to get a, a job in the financial industry in Mexico, which wasn't really an option. Uh, and I, I, you know, a friend of mine came to me with this idea and I said, yeah, sounds like a plan. Screw it. Little did I know that it was kind of like, probably the, the, the most difficult business we could go into. Um, and we would learn that the, the hard way in the following years. But uh, we started this company back when there were no, uh, you know, investment funds, VC funds. We raised money from friends, family, fools, uh, family offices, and ended up growing this company to around six or seven million dollars in revenue. Uh, you know, 150 employees, 22 locations, no tech involved, uh, and selling it to a private equity firm um, out of Austin. And that's when I, I mean, in the process, we, you know, we were on the cover of magazines and we were recognized as entrepreneurs of the year by, by several magazines and EY here in Mexico. So, you know, it, it was the early days of entrepreneurship in Mexico and uh, we had a good story to, story to tell. And when I finally exited, I thought, huh, this thing being an entrepreneur can't be so hard. I mean, if I did it once, I can definitely do it again. And now I know what I don't like about non-tech businesses. And I went to Stanford, so it'll be easy to go into tech. And with without very much uh, analysis, I decided to go into my second venture, um, InstaFit. Uh, and we raised the money from nascent venture capital funds uh, in 2013 and got off to the races. And today, uh, InstaFit turns nine. That's amazing. That's amazing. And so you 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 dove back in, and you know you you sold the co company to Easy Corp, right? They they bought right. it what three years after you started it, and you know before we get into the second venture, let's talk a little bit more about you know the the what are the key things that you know you know you, you're the first time on the journey. Uh, I mean, you must have felt pretty good because you had the success and it worked. Um, you know what what are the key things you know that you took away from that? Maybe that you were surprised when you did your second company where you're like, oh, I didn't actually encounter this uh, getting into a tech company, uh, something different. And was the was the ascent as like fast as like, you know, from oh, zero no. to zero to 150 million or, or, or whatever, zero to, to six million in, in 150 employees uh, in three years. Uh, talk a little bit more about kind of the key lessons from, you know, the, the you know, the maybe the mistakes that you made. Um, and the, the lessons you learn in those first two companies. So, so the second experience was far from what you just uh, described. Um, you know, I 
I wasn't really enjoying myself during my first time around. As a first-time founder, I had never learned from anyone. I had never worked at a startup. I had never had a mentor. Uh, I mean, we we were part of Endeavor, and that definitely helped. But, uh, you know, I, I made a lot of management mistakes. Uh, one day, I, I realized that I hated everything about my job, and there was no one to blame because I had uh, painted the walls the colors that I wanted them. I had hired everyone in the company. I had designed the offices. The, the business model was my doing, and you know I just wasn't happy. It was a very, very tough business. Uh, and when I was able to get out, I thought, okay, I, now I know what I don't want. I, I hope I'm a better manager. Uh, I later, later learned that, uh, no, I wasn't. <laughs> That's, I think I, I am still learning how to be a better manager. Uh, but I, I thought I didn't want that many employees. I wanted to, to work with, uh, more capable people. And I thought tech would attract more capable people. Uh, tech would allow me to have more impact, uh, with less people. I mean, uh, you know, the scalability of technology is one of its advantages. And I thought, uh, that I was going to be able to do it, but I made the crucial mistake of having as co-founders two people that Bright as they are, hardworking and honest as they are, they were not technical. Uh, so starting a tech company without a technical founder and relying on third parties in Venezuela was not the best way to go about building this new company. So we raised half a million bucks uh, with the idea of, you know, coming out of the gate uh, speeding. And by the end of the first year, we had... Uh, finished the entire half million and we got to 2% of our sales target for the year. So we had to basically bootstrap from then on. Uh, we weren't able to raise more money and we, we kind of stuck to our guns and maybe something that we should, we should have abandoned back in the day was, is something that, that that's still going. And, you know, it's been a company that didn't rise uh, as uh as quickly as the previous one. Uh, it's been written off by our investors <laughs> several times, I think, in the past seven years. Uh, but definitely, it is a company that has given us, given us a lot, that has had a lot of positive impact, and that uh, definitely has made us learn. So there's two things I want to double-click here. So one, um, now that you're on the other side of the table, you know, you've been in the shoes as an entrepreneur a couple times now, which you know, as a founder, I always admire, you know, I appreciate investors that have, you know, kind of been on that both sides of the table because that creates empathy. You know, you, get, you have an understanding for what it takes. Now that you're on the other side of the table as, you know, doing a little bit more investing, advising, all that stuff. When you look at companies and there is someone that doesn't have a, a technical co-founder, is that like an instant pass for you um, if it's a tech business? And is, you know, how has that influenced you in your in your decision making? Yeah, I mean, as an entrepreneur, as an investor, you can definitely relate to your past experiences, right? And maybe you're right to do so. Maybe you're not. But for me, not having a technical co-founder when you are set on building a technology company, and what I mean by a technology company is a company that has as its competitive advantage a technological product, right? It's not tech-enabled. Like, later we understood at InstaFit that we were not a tech company and we basically scrapped six years or seven years of code and moved onto a SaaS product. And the company just started working way better, right? It was easier. Uh, it was a better product than what we had built. And when, when people don't understand what the, the, the role of technology is in their projects uh, fully, then that is definitely a red flag. And when they are building a tech product, they must know tech inside and out. And for that, I think you do have to have a technical co-founder or someone who's deeply invested in the success of the company. When you look at the these companies that have been kind of bumping along for several years, I mean, InstaFit, you know, it sounded like you guys, you know, it took you a while to get going. You hung in there, you stuck it out. But you're not the flavor of the month when you're, you know, exactly. and, and there's so much momentum in this game, right? Where you're, is it the hot company? Oh, they've, you know, uh, you know, X, Y, Z fund passed, um, you know, and, and, you know, so how do you, how has that affected your, your thought process when you look at companies? Because it's really easy to be like, oh yeah, 
you know, it's something that like they just haven't been able to raise, like something must be wrong. Uh, and so how is your experience, you know, kind of sticking it out and bootstrapping a company after that initial 500K, has that reshaped how you think about companies um, and particularly in this new environment where like you've got to be able to just depend on, you know, not depend on investors because there's less capital of readily available. How has that affected your investing? Wow, for sure. That's a great question. I mean, for us, there, there came, uh, we came to a point when we had to decide whether to still go the VC route and, and try to convince people that we were cool or still cool or even still a thing. And we decided to just uh, scale back. Uh, we basically reduced our revenue probably over 60 or 70 percent, but we became profitable. And we stopped chasing growth and started chasing profitability and and creating different revenue lines. And that's what has the company alive and, and profitable today. Now, when I think about um, how that translates into my investing, the thing with companies that stick it out and then pivot and then raise another round is that their cap table is dirty. And some, at least in Latin America, in early investors are not willing to take that haircut in order to refresh the cap table and raise new money for a new business model. In that case, you know, it's kind of hard uh, for a founder to take the hit. And it, it it's more moral than reputational, I think. But still in Latin America, it, it's not very uh, well seen for people to throw in the towel and say, okay, this model didn't work. Now I'm moving on to a new idea and you are shit out of luck, right? As my previous investors. Um, you know, it, it's tough. Uh, I understand and I am of the idea that previous investors should be taken care of uh, in, in the amount as possible. But it's also the game that they're playing, right? Some you win, some you lose. And, and you have to factor in that the possibility of you losing your money is real. Um, so when I see a company that's been around for a while, not really gaining a lot of traction, uh, and there is not a, it's all about storytelling. If there is not a good story behind it, uh, and and the new model comes from actual learnings and not just a, another Hail Mary pass by the founder to salvage the company, then I think, uh, you know, it's something worth looking into. Yeah, I think in the current, you know, environment, there's going to be more companies that are probably more focused inward rather than outward. Uh, right. You know, I think that that's something that, you know, the last couple of years, you know, and, and storytelling is an important quality, but if you are just depending on storytelling to, you know, draw this narrative up to, to raise capital. Well, uh, the numbers you know, tell the, the story. The, <laughs> yeah, the numbers tell the story and the chickens come to roost and, you know, you need to be, ma make sure you've got, you know, execution and, and you know, growth uh, on your side. Speaking of growth, you're an expert at building audiences. You know, I've observed it. Why is that important or is it important for founders, uh, you know, and, and how they go about building businesses, uh, you know, building, do they build it? Should they build an audience themselves for their projects? You know, I mean, I started this podcast before I started Latitude um, and it, you know, is kind of parlayed as an asset for our business. Um, do you think that's something that most founders should do? Um, and uh, or is it is it just too hard to, to, to do and there's other strategies. It's, you know, g give me your two cents on that. And do a lot of com founders come and ask you for help on that uh, if they decide to go that route? You know what? Uh, one of the key mistakes that I see founders make in when they're at the top or where, when they're on the rise is not taking advantage of their position. And every, everything they do goes towards building the brand, right? And that's great. But then if the company goes under, if the company is sold, if uh, the founder is pushed out, then they're basically left with nothing. And I've seen friends of mine build $100 million companies and then by some disagreement with the board are pushed out and, and you know, they, they, they have to start from scratch. And Naval Radikant, who is someone who I admire a lot, um, says this very clearly. Uh, you, you have to build your brand and this is something that you cannot set aside because before... A personal brand was just called reputation. And, and 
a reputation is something you build with your close circle and the people you actually interact with on a day-to-day basis or during the course of your regular business. But now building a, a personal brand as a founder or as a, just as a, as a person who adds value at any level uh, is a great asset. Um, for the past 11 or 12 years that I've been a founder, uh, I've built my, I've been the speaker for my companies. If you Google my name, you'll see me like working out on, t- on morning TV shows, uh, cooking healthy meals, talking about the circular economy. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've worn this different, many different hats. Uh, and in the end, it's just contributed to building my brand as an entrepreneur or someone who has intelligence uh, in, in the markets. Um, I do think this is something that can add value. And just look at uh, Elon Musk. Elon Musk can move the market, can raise money for his startups just by tweeting, right? He is the man and the brand at the same time. Having said this, Brian, I think it's uh, also a slippery slope. And you see a lot of founders just paying more attention to building their brand and, and you know, doing the, the rounds at conferences and speaking. And, and that actually distracts them from the, the real purpose of doing all this, which is building the company and having this uh, or providing results to their investors, but also to their community. And that's where I think the two, the two uh, roads intersect. When you are building a company, sometimes we are more focused on the outside, right? Raising money. And that seems to be the success metric. When the real success metric is how big is your customer base or how, how well do you serve them? Um, and when you think about building an audience, whether you are a brand or you're a, a person, you need to understand who that audience is. Like, what's the user persona? What do they like? What, in what ways can you actually add them value and serve them? Because if you approach, whether it's building a business or a personal brand with that mindset, then the results will be the same. You will connect. Uh, you will have a loyal follower base or, or user base, and then your company will grow. For me, uh, and this was kind of like a, a, a byproduct because I never thought about building an audience for myself when I started the podcast. But now it's a huge community, right? Like hundreds of thousands of people listen to stuff that I put out every week. And now that's allowed me to build companies catered to that community that I know so well. So I, I am still a founder. I am not a tech founder right now. Like I have a, a new tropics business. I have the VC fund, uh, which has a lot of my community members and uh, fellow founders uh, investing in the fund. Um, I have an education company. I am a keynote speaker all over the country and other countries internationally. And, and that just developed organically from knowing my audience, understanding their needs and trying to put out stuff that works for them. I'm going to quote Jay-Z here. I'm a business man. And exactly. I think that's, uh, that, that, that's, that's what it comes down to, right? I mean, you're, you're, you know, you're building up your, your personal brand, which you parlayed into a, a bunch of different things. And, you know, cause I, I recently thought about it as I was starting Latitude, I was like, oh, should I invest in building my personal brand on social media, you know, putting out content, you know, under my name or, or in the company name. And I think it's, but my conclusion is that when you, build your personal brand like that, you know, that basically can elevate your, your company. And then as the company rises in, in, in recognition and, and notoriety and, you know, solving problems for customers, uh, that, that helps your, your, your personal brand. So kind of one hand washes the other. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. I, I think maybe before you had like these two verticals that didn't really intersect. Now I think you can't really have one without the other. Mike, look at, uh, Ricardo Weather. From Justo. He's not building his personal brand, but he's like a top LinkedIn voice, right? And he is speaking at events and everybody knows who he is because he's a great founder and he's on podcasts. And while he's speaking about Justo, I mean, he's also speaking about himself. So you cannot really Absolutely. separate one from the other. Yeah, I think that like there's probably a higher value to be extracted from um, a, a very specific type of business, probably like if you're a B2B business, 
you know, I mean, we're in the business of helping startups. And so, you know, that's a very targeted market and building a brand inside that segment is probably easier. But I mean, if you're working, you know, in, you know, in any other sector and you're, you know, you identify an opportunity where, you know, whether it's healthcare and you, you know, and, and you're kind of the expert in, you know, in that kind of field and you're bringing on, you know, key leaders there, you're also going to be, you know, you're going to build a, a strong reputation and brand inside that, inside that community. So I think that probably if you're a consumer brand, it makes it a little bit harder. Um, but if you're very effective and you garner a large enough audience, you know, this is actually something that I've been thinking about and I would love your take on it. I had a call this morning with a founder. Uh, he's from Trinidad and he lives in LA and he's looking at doing something, um, you know, uh, without kind of divulging the, the business, something in Latin America. And it's related to, you know, music and kind of celebrities. And when I was talking with him this morning, I was like, we were brainstorming on ideas. And if you look at the evolution of venture and startup ecosystem in the US, you know, I mean, Andreessen Horowitz famously brought on like, you know, huge artists like, you know, Nas and all these other like very well-known, uh, a lot of hip hop artists and others and got them to invest in stuff. And there's been this massive crossover between media personalities, influencers, you know, Kylie Jenner with her, her products. And so there's this crazy intersection of media and venture. And I'm wondering what the future of Latin America holds. You know, Maluma getting into La House, Anita joining the board of Nubank. Are we on the cusp of a, a you know, a massive kind of revolution where you've got people that have, instead of doing endorsement deals, they're, they're, they're taking equity pieces and they're putting their money oh, into these businesses. For sure. That's happening all over the place. I mean, just last night you had Lenny Kravitz visiting Mexico, launching his own brand of Sotol, which is a Mexican moonshine from the Northwest. Uh, and Maluma came out, came out with his own mezcal and Carlos Rivera has his own mezcal as well. And uh, celebrities or influencers like Luisito Comunica, his own tequila and Luis Gerardo Mendez, his own mezcal. And that's just like the, 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 the liquor industry. Right. And then you have uh, I was just talking to someone who is partnering with Jay Balvin on a mental health app. So. And, and they're definitely taking a stake. And, you know, we, we saw investors coming in, like Ashton Kutcher, and he's invested all over the place, right? He also has his own VC fund. Tony Robbins has just invested in a company that I'm an investor in, Beak, um, the, the audiobooks app. And obviously, that's going to translate into Mexico. I mean, where, uh, I mean, are, are the celebrities sophisticated enough? Uh, to understand the opportunity that they have uh, in their hands. Uh, I don't know. I think some, some are, and they will. Uh, but th they will become entrepreneurs in their own regard. You see Jessica Alba with the Honest brand. Uh, and that's, that's become so popular and so visible in the U.S. that it's bound to happen in Latin America. You have to be big, big enough. Yeah, you've got to be big enough. I mean, I, I was just, uh, you know, I, I got introduced to Mantis, which is the chain smokers, um, you know, mm -hmm. their fund. Right. And they were, yeah. they were, they were poking around in Brazil a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, so I, I do think that there is this, you know, when you have built in distribution and you've got an individual brand, um, you know, you can bring in, uh, you know, capital and, um, you know, and network and, you know, all of those things and, and, you know, uh, you know, audience all in the same. And I mean, if you, if I'm a founder and I'm like, Oh, I could take money, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, in the music, you know, streaming business and I, I could take money from like, you know, uh, the chain smokers, or I could take money from like, you know, X, Y, V, C that, you know, is, doesn't have a huge brand. Um, you know, that's, that's something that I would definitely like, it would make sense because it, it fits my thesis. Right. Yeah. But you have to be very careful because, uh, that comes with a lot of liability as well. Uh, just look at what happened today with Kanye West and Adidas and uh, Valenciaga and everybody dropping him and, and taking kids up 200 or $300 million just uh, because the contract had to be pulled. Uh, you know, when, when, and as a, as a personal brand myself, all that I do is relying on me still being someone reputable, uh, trustworthy. If I come out and, you know, uh, and someone tapes me slapping a, a baby cat or whatever, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that can definitely ruin, right? Uh, and that can ruin your business. Um, you know, 
Traditionally, we had seen this with media companies doing the media for equity deals, uh, which more often than not were, were crap deals. Uh, now you're seeing the media for equity from the influencers because you, what you're getting is exposure. You have to be able to price this right and have you know ironclad contracts that allow you to manage your risks accordingly. And I would also advise, I, I'm an investor in a, a company called Bachans, which is a Japanese barbecue sauce. It's my longtime friend, Justin Gill. Shout out to him. Known him since I, we were kids. And, you know, he got a bunch of like big names on board. But one of the things that I advised him is, hey, you should be making sure that these people put a check in too. Because there's right. a lot of people out there just on the hustle that are just like, oh, I got this big brand. I got, you know, I got 5 million Instagram followers. And it's just like, no, you need, as you said, ironclad kind of participation it's not enough that you're super famous and well known. You know what are you going to do for for the brand? And that's something that I think is 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 fundamental. That founders might be like wooed and kind of like excited because like someone that's really well known, it takes an interest in what they're building. But like as a founder, you've got to get clear deliverables and and execution. And if they put money in, best believe they're going to promote the brand because exactly. they got money riding on it. So I mean, you are an investor as well, and you're an advisor. And I'm, I'm getting approached over and over again to become an advisor because I'll pass on a deal with a fund or as an angel. And then they'll say, oh, no, no, but we want you as an advisor. And I'm like, no, I advise the companies I invest in. Uh, and that's where my money is. And that's where my investors' money is. And that's where my attention should be. Um, so, yeah, I, I would definitely look for an investment in money and equity, and then maybe complement that with some advisory shares or some sort of like promotional deal. Uh, you see a lot of, uh, you know, Checo Perez investing money into Kavak, and then part of the deal was his, uh, the use of his uh, likeness. Uh, Memo Choa, the national goalkeeper for Mexico, same. So, you know, you, you have all these types of deals that uh, can definitely boost a company's awareness, uh, but you have to be very careful and not be, you know, uh, dazzled by the mirrors. Yeah, exactly. You can't be just enamored by by somebody just because they are well known. You know, let's talk a little bit about the fund. So you've invested in a couple startups. You you know, this is re relatively recent because it was kind of an expansion of your angel investing, right? Um, you you know, you've kind of evolved into the Cracks Fund. You leverage the brand, which I think is brilliant because you you know you b built the brand and you built the demand for people wanting to work with you before you had the money, and then you went out and got the money, right? Talk, talk a little bit more about that. Right. So I had been, you know, as a, as a founder, I never had enough cash flow to actually invest. Uh, so when I launched the podcast and started building this uh, new cash flow positive company that, uh, you know, is something that I had never experienced before, uh, you know, I had, I had the funds to start investing. So I started doing it. And I quickly realized that in order to, Keep, to stay in the game, you know, the VC game, without building a, a VC backable company myself, I needed to take it up a notch. And I saw, I saw the, the opportunity was ripe, right? Like I had people who wanted to get in. I had the, the projects coming in for advice or for help in connecting to other players in the ecosystem. And all I needed to do was to, just to, to do it right and, and build the, the bridge that connected these two. And like everything that I do, um, I tried to do it very efficiently, very simply. So I decided to build the fund on AngelList. I'm a solo GP. So I have no analysts, no employees, no investment committee. Uh, I rely on my 80 plus LPs, which are founders, uh, investment managers, you know, cracks on their own, in their own regard, um, uh, to, to, do or help with the analysis and uh, come up with the decision whether to invest or not. And it's turned out great. Uh, I raised, my initial target was 5 million. I'm uh, past that point now. The fund's still open. Um, but we've invested in nine companies. Uh, the companies are doing great. Um, you know, I, I really like every founder that I've invested in. Uh, I, I try to make myself available for anything that I want myself, my time, my, uh, my capital, obviously they, they already have and my network. And three of my companies have gone on to raise uh, subsequent rounds, uh, in this short period of time. So I think overall it's going pretty well. When people ask, how's the fund going? I go like, okay, come back in seven years and, and we'll talk. 
<laughs> yeah, that's the truth about venture is that it takes a while for it to to really know if you're actually a good investor. Uh, right. And that's something that, you know, but but there are some strong signals. And I think that, uh, you know, it, it helps that, you know, you've built, you know, reputation and you've attracted the right people because, you know, ultimately when you're investing, it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's you know, finding, you know, or sourcing, picking and winning, right? Those are the three things you need to master. And when you're, when you, when you have a brand, you've got kind of a magnet, right? Because you're, you're, you pull the, the investments in, um, you know, your, your own criteria uh, you've developed over time, having talked to lots of founders and, you know, and having built a business yourself and then winning, it also helps when you build a brand because, you know, what is your differentiator? Well, I've got um, hundreds of thousands of people that, you know, listen to the podcast. I've got, you know, um, this experience as a founder, I've been in the trenches and those are all things that you constantly, you, you, you know, people don't realize that when you're an investor, you've got to sell yourself to the best founders of because course. the best founders have many options. And so um, these are key differentiators that you've built. I think, I think winning is the hardest part. Uh, yes, you have all the bling and that com coming back to uh, what we were just talking about uh, with uh, celebrities and artists. Uh, but I think that the real leverage that you can build or you can have when, when, you, when it comes to winning is the testimonials that your current portfolio companies have about you, right? Uh, or whatever they can say about you as, a, as a, an investor, as an advisor, as a general value-added person. And fortunately enough for me, uh, the comments have been uh, pretty good. So that's, that's helped me win some competitive deals and that has me very happy. It surprised me that a lot of funds don't actually do like an NPS or, you know, gauge the, the, the satisfaction of their, of their portfolio, because at the end of the day, like that, that is the strongest driver of future opportunities is your existing portfolio. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I get surprised when, you know, f you know, funds don't think about that as much on the media side. So you've got the podcast, you know, you, you've got a bunch of stuff going in. In fact, um, I was, uh, really pleased to get an invite and you, you know, you hosted a little dinner at your house, you and your wife, it was really great. And I got to meet all these other cracks, right? I'm like, wow, this, this is like, you know, uh, people at the top of their game, whether it's, you know, in business or, you know, just like just people that have done interesting things that have, you know, reshaped either their industries or, and so for me, it was, it was really cool. And so part of what you're doing is, and you mentioned a key word, I just want to double click on that you know, you mentioned uh, community also, right? So this goes beyond just, you know, having a conversation. Um, how have you taken this from the kind of online, you know, you know, podcasting to the, the real world? So that's one of the ways that I'm doing it, right? Every month I host a small group dinner at my place with eight people invited. Um, cracks, some have episodes in the podcast, some don't. Uh, but like people from the media industry, uh, the plastic arts industry, sports, entrepreneurship, general business. And what I, and what I try is try is to curate this group of people that haven't really met or know about each other. Uh, you know, we spend so much time getting good at our game and keeping our head down and just hustling that we become a little bit one dimensional at, at points. Um, and what I try to do with these dinners is just to open up the conversation and show people that they have a lot to learn from people that they don't really care to investigate much about. Uh, maybe you don't watch the news or maybe you don't follow certain YouTubers or maybe you don't really like soccer. But when you talk to a guy who's been, you know, the, 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 the captain of the national soccer team during three World Cups, you know, something something clicks. If you are a curious person, which you probably are, if you're invited to that dinner and if you're uh, playing at the top of your game, I mean, we, we learn and we're learners and we have growth mindsets. And when, when you're, uh, uh, when you're sat with all these people who just kind of get your juices flowing, it's just amazing. And relationships develop and I kind of step aside. Uh, you know, I, I like to be, when I was at Stanford, there was this really famous business case about a woman who back in the day shaped, shaped Silicon Valley. 
Uh, and her name was Heidi, Ro Heidi Rosen or Roizen. I, I don't know. I never learned how to uh, sp uh, pronounce her last name. But she hosted dinners at her place where, you know, Sergey Brin was there and uh, Larry Ellison was there. And she basically was a connector that helped this fabric of Silicon Valley evolve. And if I can play a little role in developing the ecosystem beyond the traditional meet and greet and happy hour of the entrepreneurial ecosystem, then I'll be very happy. And that's obviously opened a lot of doors for me. Uh, I, I'm a giver and I, I never expect anything from these uh, meetings to come back to me, but it invariably does, right? Yeah, I felt very lucky to be included in that because it was like my first week in Mexico. And I was like, I didn't know anyone, like I had no community. And then I get to, you know, sit across from Chumel Torres, like telling these amazing stories, like all the way to like two in the morning, I think we were there. My wife actually got really scared because <laughs> I came home at like 2.30 in the morning and she, you know, I, and I didn't have my phone on because I was like so in tune with everybody because the, the conversation was so fascinating and I actually met Alejandro from Dila and, and, I, and I had him on the podcast also. So, um, you know, that, that you've, you've, you know, been a great contributor to my, I guess my landing in Mexico. I think that you made me feel like I actually had well, some friends missed, when I first got here. The party, man. We had like the I, reunion and you missed it. I missed it, man. I was traveling, but, uh, but I, but I, I, I really, um, I really appreciate that. And I think it's, it's really important also to have it outside of just the, you know, the echo chamber of tech, because, yeah. you know, you, you, you know, you can get inspired by other industries and learn so much. And that beginner's mindset is, is so critical for you to kind of, you know, foment a different, you know, thought process that, you know, inspires you. So uh, I, I really, uh, I think that's a, a, a really great uh, activity that you have. And I think it's smart to bring it kind of to the real world. I've been thinking about more, you know, in real life stuff that, you know, that we've, you know, we, we have our event, we're actually hosting an event. Uh, I don't want to announce the official date here because I'm still defining the, a location of it, but probably in March, we're hosting our Vamos Latam Summit, which I'd love to have you there as one of my guests. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's a great way to get people together. And I've just seen the value of bringing people together in real life. Now, I want to kind of wrap up with a couple things here. Um, you know, you're also an author, which I just basically copied you. Okay. Um, you know, I, 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 I started a podcast after you started a podcast and I wrote a book too. Um, so, well, you, wrote the book you know, before. Maybe, maybe, maybe before. I guess it feels like yours has made more rounds than mine. Uh, I just, I've just heard about it. But the, the, you know, so the book, and what I love about the book is, you know, there's a piece of it, and one, you, you might not know this, but it, at Latitude, our virtues are, um, you know, we have a bunch of different virtues. One of the virtues is GSD, which, you know, I'll tell you a little bit of story behind that. You know, I always had some insecurities around not going to like a top business school because everyone I met went to Stanford like you. And I'm like, wow, these people are so impressive. And I remember like thinking like, oh, I didn't study business. Can I be a business leader? You know, that's my early, my twenties, kind of like your own personal battles that you, that you face. And so we came up, I came up with this, you know, this, um, virtue of D GSD and it's kind of a, uh, you know, wordplay on GSB, right. Which, uh, you know, attend the school of GSD of get shit done. And I know that's, you know, um, a big part of your book is, you know, moving on to doing meaningful shit or DMS, right? Um, right. So how would you advise startup founders to make that transition? And what are the steps they need to take? Oh, man. I mean, that, that, that is a subject that I could ramble about for hours. Um, so I had this wall, this this yellow wall behind my desk at InstaFit. And it, uh, my team just had these really cool letters stuck to the wall that get that, the red, get shit done. And that was like my thing, right? Like uh, for, for 20 years, I just got shit done. I wasn't the idea guy. I just got the idea and got to work and made things happen. And in the end, I mean, you get so caught up with doing stuff and never stopping to smell the roses and never really celebrating your successes and it never really being enough that you can kind of get lost. And that, that happened to me. And I found myself in this really dark place uh, after 10 years building businesses, uh, just being irritable, uh, estranged from my family, uh, from myself, not, not enjoying life, uh, no matter what, uh, anything that happened around me 
could be interpreted as a as something that hurt me and I was constantly being angry and sad and it was just dark. And there was this day when my, my wife just came to me and said, why do you hate your life? And it made me stop on my tracks and really take a, a deep look at uh, at who I was, what I wanted to build, what, who I wanted to become. And, and I embarked in this like self-discovery, personal growth journey that is reflected in the book. And it's, you know, basically a five-step process that uh, englobes a lot of tools and books and courses and, you know, podcasts that I've uh, listened to. And it's just basically de- deciding or going through who, who you are and where you are. Like sometimes we feel uh, uncomfortable and we can't really put our finger on what is exactly making us uncomfortable. So where you are, where you want to be, and that comes with, uh, you know, getting rid of our chains and just setting goals that are not tied to past results and just letting ourselves dream. And then how you make time uh, to to actually focus on building these uh, dream results, Uh, how to create a a plan that produces these results, and it, it comes to basically focus, prioritization and focus. And then in the end... You know, this sounds like a pretty run-of-the-mill productivity program, but what actually makes this worth it and worthwhile and important to me is the last part, which is why does it all matter? Like, why do you want to become this person? Why do you want to achieve these goals? Why why does it really matter? And I talk about the two sides to motivation, your gran mana, which is what I call it, your like your MTP, your massive transformative purpose. And then... Your, your big pain, which I call it, yeah, the, your gran batalla, which is something that we shy away from. We sweep under the, ru- the rug. We all have this thing that kind of puts us in motion because we are hell-bent uh, on never going back to that place. Uh, and once we connect with these two sides of motivation, then uh, we can actually put our, our mind, our heart, our time, our resources into building all this that we've uh, envisioned. And, you know, when, when you have this clarity, you're able to uh, decide whether to pursue a project or not, whether to embark on a new business venture or not, whether to uh, develop a relationship or not, or basically just cut it from your life. And it just makes sense. Um, so anyone who is an entrepreneur or not, uh, I would definitely encourage them to to take a look at the book. So... You can pick the book up, Haz lo que importa, right. and check out the fund, fund on Angelus. How do you find the fund on Angelus in case there's any potential LPs listening? Yeah, well, uh, you can go to the deck. Uh, it's, I think it's hidden on Angelus, but you can go to cracks, oh, C-R-A-C-K-S dot L-A slash forward slash deck. So cracks dot L-A forward awesome. slash yeah, in deck. Case- in case we've got any any investors listening, we have you know an audience of founders, investors, operators. So, um, well, listen, I want to I want to thank you. You know, I I really one thing that I observed from you during that you know dinner you hosted that really fun uh, night was, you know, you really kicked it off with like sharing you know openly and vulnerably about your journey, and I think that that put everyone in this comfortable position where they were like you know kind of. It was, you know, 10 people that didn't know each other, really, I guess nine people, because you and your wife know each other, but, and you know, everyone individually, but a lot of, you know, we didn't know each other. And I think that that created this uh, environment that, um, you know, allowed for people to kind of open up and share more of their personal stories. And then those, you know, generated deeper connections. And so I think that, you know, part of that process of writing your book probably got you in touch with some of that stuff. And, uh, you know, I think you make everyone more comfortable when you, you know, you, you kind of lead with that vulnerability. So I just wanted to commend you for that and, and congratulate you on all the stuff that you've, uh, you know, you built and it's great to kind of be part of your community in some ways. And you're part of the latitude community as well. So hey, look forward to continue to collaborate. Yeah, that's right. You are, you are. I love, I love having you involved. So, um, we're going to do lots of stuff together and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's great to, uh, you know, to, to count with your support and, uh, and, you know, you, you give me something to look up to with this podcast. <laughs> Thank you, man. I mean, you've been a, a great inspiration. Uh, what you've built in such short time is just like mind blowing the team you've built, the, the, the reach that you have, uh, all throughout the region is just like amazing. Uh, and I definitely look forward to everything we can do together. Thanks. Absolutely, man. Thank you so much.